pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, I ask that you bless this word, that this, as it goes out, that upon its hearing, that hearts will be touched, that my voice will not be heard, that my things, my stuff won't be heard, but Father God, rather things that are of you, things that are holy, and things that are majestic. Amen. <coughs> so we all know about win-win situations, but what about the lose-lose ones? You know those catch-22s, those darned if you do, darned if you don't ones? You know, the ones that kind of make you feel like you are stuck in the middle somewhere? I mean, are you stuck? between impossible choices, wrestling with yourself, with others about it? Are you feeling like a situation has just gone on for far too long and it's kind of gone into this uncomfortable direction and you just kind of don't know what to do? If you do that, you'll, you'll have to deal with this. But if you do this, then you'll have to deal with that. Lose, lose. Is it a relationship predicament weighing heavy on you? Maybe there's something of, of hidden. Maybe there's something with your family. Maybe it's deciding what to do or, or, or just what to say. Is it work? Is it impossible to do what, what people are asking of you? Do you feel like it's impossible to say no in this situation? Are you being pressured by friends? Are there different agendas at work? facing you down, be it from people, the forces that be, even religious, political agendas, whatever. Whatever that is, it's forcing you into those places that feel just so lose-lose. Maybe it's your own agenda forcing you into that place. Your own pressure that you put on yourself, perhaps. Maybe who you want to be and maybe what you're doing isn't matching up with currently who you are. Pressure and guilt and indecisiveness, follow through, fear and courage, the unknown. It's alive. What do they want from you? What do they want from you? What do you want from you? Too many voices, too much pressure, and too many consequences. All of it's kind of blazing in your mind, burning a hole in your sleep. And it all can feel like, like the heat of a courtroom, just, just like you're on trial, or at the very least, sitting in the jury box with two sides just kind of throwing matches at you. Lose, lose. What do you choose? In the last two weeks, you know, we've had earthquakes in Chile. I have a cousin that lives there in California. And all of those earthquakes are part of that infamous ring of fire. And it's caused from this fiery <coughs> rubbing of the earth's plates and where something just has to give. And that's the kind of pressure and fire that you feel like you're under sometimes, right? I mean, it's so much. You see, being in those moments, especially when they're prolonged, there's usually two reactions from that kind of pressure. Either a quiet shutdown, <coughs> where it just kind of bubbles and scrapes underneath, or a loud acting out with shaking, tremors, and eruptions. You either keep it all yourself and wrestle with it, or you make a lot of flipping noise to whatever and whoever is in your way. Eruptions. Many times you wish you didn't have to choose, right? Like, just wish it would all go, kind of go away, resolve itself somehow. Wouldn't that be easy? But the voices and the demands coming your way, they demand decision. They want a verdict. What's it going to be? You'd like to not be in this hot seat in this situation, but you are. You are. And something has to be done. It's only a matter of time before the eruption and the meltdown begins. Maybe it already has. Maybe it already has. Lose, lose. What do you choose? You know, I know the thought of it is scary because I've made wrong choices before. We all have, right? Many times you already know the answer. You're just afraid to execute it. We've all been there juggling fear, and courage, and faith until one of the ball drops. Which is it going to be? Fear or faith? How many chances do you think we get to do the right thing? to choose the way before it's chosen for us. How long before it becomes a ghost of a chance? 
See, one of the things I learned a long time ago in my own life is that not making a choice is making a choice. We don't like to choose, though, because the consequences are difficult, and they are hard, and they are messy. Especially when it's the right thing. That path is always a rocky one. It always is. But it's a more rewarding one if you wait and see and work through it. But we want to avoid all that, right? So to avoid that backlash, we kind of just stay where we are sometimes, dodging decision. <coughs> How do you begin to navigate this situation, this lose-lose, to figure out not only what you need to do, but what the right thing is, how to do it? What kinds of questions do you ask yourself? Is it, what, what do I need to do? How can I resolve this? What actions can I take? How can I avoid this? What's my plan? What's in my power to do here? And it's interesting, when you really think about it, just how many people think that they have power over you. And even further, you believe that they do. And that grants them it. Do you think that that is what's created this situation for you? What about the flip side? Without even realizing it, how many people do you feel, assume, and take power over in your situation? Do you think that contributes to your lose-lose predicament? What's your part in this? Does the answer lie in your power? Does it lie in their power? And where is God in these moments? What does he have to say? What is truth? Michaela began this conversation, if you were here last week, began this conversation with Pilate where he asked Jesus, he says, Jesus, are, are you a criminal? Are, are you a prophet? Are you a blasphemer? Are you a king? Tell me what you are. And I think so many times we miss the truth that Jesus is trying to bring because we are constantly trying to reduce Jesus and religion to these labels, to these boxes that we can understand. So today, as we tell the story, I want you to keep thinking about exactly what is the truth in your situation? Today, the scripture provides some insight. It's about chances, it's about a trial and error. Now, talking to Jesus, Pilate, he's starting to get a little bit nervous. Now, Jesus has already said to him, you know, my kingdom is of another world. And Pilate, he's, he's like, what does that even mean? I, I've never heard anyone talk like that. So Pilate says, well, what is truth? He then goes out to the crowd of Jewish leaders and he says, Look, I talked to Jesus and I don't find any guilt in him at all. Now this is the second time in their conversation where Pilate is kind of trying to, he's trying to wiggle out of the decision. You know, where he has this, this chance. It's come to him and it's knocking on his door this opportunity to do the right thing. Knock, knock. And he lets it pass him by. Pilate then says to the crowd, your laws, hey, I know, I know, your laws say I can release one prisoner a year. Now, you want me to release Barabbas, this murderer, this upriser, or Jesus, this smooth-talking king one be? Murderer or Jesus? Give us Barabbas. Give us the murderer. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Pilate says nothing in response to that. Another chance, gone by. So he takes Jesus, and he has him beat, and he has him whipped. And as the soldiers take him, they are laughing. They are laughing, and they are hitting him in the face. Some kidding you are, smack. And so they twist together this crown of thorns, and they press it into his head, and Jesus cries out. They dress him in this purple robe, the color of royalty, and they say, oh, <laughs> All hail the king of the Jews. And then they hit him in the face again. One of the things, you know, when I really was, was praying about it this week, one of the things that I take from this moment is that Jesus' words, he said that he is a different kind of king. And that in this moment that it rings true, in this moment we know that Jesus is the king of suffering. We know that he's the king of humiliation, the king of the mocked and of the outcast. Which is why he means so much to us. <clears throat> Do you not feel like you've suffered and been mocked and outcast? 
Your Jesus knows you. Your Jesus gets you. Your situation may be humiliated to you and you may feel left out, but your Jesus gets you. He's with you. So Pilate comes out. He comes out again to the crowd. And he's, this time he's getting more and more nervous. And he's standing next to Jesus and he says, Here is the man. Here he is, y'all. He's talking to the Jewish leaders. I don't find any basis for a charge. No reason for him to be here. Knock, knock. Another chance. No answer. Crucify! The crowd still yells, Crucify! And Pilate shoots back, knock, knock. But I find no guilt in him. I find no guilt in him. Pilate doesn't stand his ground. The Jewish leaders, the heads of the church shout, He says he's the son of God. The law says he must die. Pilate's face, it goes white. He, sa he says he's what? The son of God. The son of God. The son of God. Verse 8 says, when Pilate heard this, that he was even more afraid. Consequences and chances. <coughs> you see, Pilate said, hey, what if I execute the Son of God? What if I don't? Pilate is scared out of his wits. He has an angry mob outside his gates and a potential riot if he doesn't. He could lose his place as ruler of the Roman precinct of Judea if he does not do this. Caesar could crucify him. But like looking in on the story like with this third eye that we have when we read it, it seems kind of silly. Like lose your fancy job or kill a man of God. Right? It's that fear of losing control. That fear of losing power and position. Is that where you find yourself in your pickle? Are you afraid to lose something? Are you afraid to lose it? Are you afraid of the riot that will ensue because of your decision? Are you afraid to lose your grip on control? Something, someone, someplace? Are you worried about losing your position, your place, somehow losing that? It's a label removed. What is truth? So Pilate, he is frightened of consequence. And he runs back into the palace. He runs back into the palace. He's thinking, Son of God, oh my gosh. And he says to Jesus, come on. Where, where did you come from? Where do you come from? Who are you? And Jesus, he just sits there and he doesn't say a word. And he just kind of looks off into the distance. You won't talk to me? My gosh, don't you know? Don't you know I have the power? I have the power to set you free or kill you. Jesus, he turns his head and he locks eyes and he says, you have power? You would not have power if it were not given to you from above. We better recognize there's a certain humility and reverence and fear that comes from recognizing your place. Recognizing your place, that there's someone with greater consequences and power than even the Caesar in your life. Something happens in this moment. It's a shift in the scripture because the word says from then on, Pilate really tried to set Jesus free. Knock, knock. Consequences and chances will he answer. It says he tried to set him free, but the Jewish leaders, they kept shouting. They kept shouting. Shouting. That word has an emotional charge to it. Shouting. The growing mob mentality, this ball of heightened emotions is taking over. Shouting. Can you relate? How many times is there shouting in your situation? Shouting. So much so that you get blinded by the growing raw emotion of it all. In fact, you forget what you were yelling about in the first place. <laughs> Just like that day, these Jewish leaders are so overcome in the moment with emotion that they go against everything that they hold dear in the Passover. What is truth? So Pilate says again, here is your king. And they scream back, we have no king but Caesar. <laughs> really? Leaders of the church? Isn't that why they plotted to kill Jesus? Because he's a man that aligned himself with God? 
And now they, the Jewish leaders, put a man above God on Passover, no less. <laughs> We're not talking about Caesar, really. Leaders of the church. My, you get it. How your emotions can blind us and make us say things that we don't mean, but yet still say to get what we want. Power. See, when you hear this story, you get this strange feeling like the tables are being turned. That it's not just Jesus on trial before the crowd, but that it's Pilate on trial before Jesus. Trial and error. As Pilate stands with the Son of God in those hours, it's up, it's up Jesus is seeing right inside him, looking all in him. But we all stand where Pilate stood at some time in our life, face to face with Jesus in this place of decision. It's hard to stare down what feels like a lose-lose. It really is. It's hard to make any decision that feels comfortable, but good decisions are not measured by how easy the choices are to carry out, but something more. We talked about truth. We talked about power. Jesus is power. He is the way and the truth and the life. And that must be your gauge in this situation that you are in. Faced with decision, I want you to ask yourself about each option. Is this the way that Jesus would choose for me? Is this the truth Jesus would want me standing in? And is this the life that Jesus would have for me? Which option bears his fruits the most? Test every choice with those questions. Is this way a truth that leads to life? And life abundantly? Look, you, you, you may be tap dancing around someone's power over you. Or you may be dealing with the fear of losing your own. But this passage, it begs us to ask, what is power? And what does our power look like when compared with God's power? Do we need to be taken down a notch? So many times we rely solely on what we can do. What our plan is. Sometimes we are like Pilate staring Jesus in the face. Don't you know that I have the power? Look at me, I don't need you in this. Oh, really? Because it sure looks like you do. <laughs> Have you taken action without even consulting the Christ that's sitting right before you? <coughs> exactly who's sovereign here, anyway? Those who humble themselves will be exalted, and those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Realize where the power is and where it comes from. As you make decisions, I want you to kind of step back. I want you to step back like Jesus going onto the mountain or in the garden. I want you to step back. I want you to be still. And in those moments, I want you to think about it. And without thinking about the fear, to cast it aside, cast all the consequences aside, without thinking about what you could potentially lose, I want you to ask yourself, what's the right thing to do? Forgetting the worries, forgetting the difficulty it would take to achieve it, or how people would feel about it, what's the right thing? You may not like the answer, and it may take a lot of courage and grit to get it done, but how much courage and grit do you think it took Jesus to get to that cross? A lot. A lot. He tried to hand it away in the garden, but he stood and he walked, and that same courage and grit is in you. And so our scripture today from James says, then you will recognize wisdom from heaven because it's pure. You'll recognize it when it comes to you because it's peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and full of good fruit. It's impartial and it's sincere. You must sow in peace to reap in peace. One of the things, like really, I always have these moments when I prepare. One of the things I love about the story is that Jesus, like, there he is, right? Endowed with all the power of heaven. <laughs> chooses to set it aside. Which, when you think about it, is really is just a different way to use it, right? <clears throat> There's something to be said for restraint. There's something to be said for controlled action and power. Perhaps it's time you set yours aside. 
Remember that just because you can does not mean you should. This moment, this story could be like Pilate's Knox. Coming as an opportunity for you. It's knocking. It's knocking. So as it knocks, is it Pilate's ears in our ears? How is old Pilate doing? Even though we know how it ends, let's check in and see if he answers the door. Verse 13, he brings Jesus out and he sits down on the judgment seat. Now there's different, there's a lot of argument through pastors and in the scholars that whether it was Jesus on sitting on the seat or whether it was Pilate on that seat, depending upon which one that they look at. However, they come out and they're both there at that judgment seat and he says to the Jews, here he is. Here is your king. He had said, here is your man. Here is the man. Now he says, here is the king. Shall I crucify him? They shout, yes, 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 take him away. And Pilate then hands him over to be crucified. It's a decision that would haunt him for years to come. And I don't want that for you. I don't want that for you. See, like Pilate, you may feel pressure and confusion and dealing with consequences and chances, but how many chances do you think you are going to get to do the right thing? How many times will it knock before you pass it, for it passes you by? So today I say, talk to God. Talk to Him. Bear your soul. He's there like He was with Pilate. He's not standing over Pilate and scary. He's sitting down. He's sitting down. You have His ear. Bear your soul to Him. And realize it's only His power that can free you. Pilate stared Jesus in the face and said, I have power to free you or kill you. And as I prayed about that all week, God laid the message from, from 2 Peter on my heart. And it says that my divine power has granted to you all things that pertain to godliness and life. You see, God doesn't grant us our own power, but rather His power. A power that when used towards godly decisions in your life is unstoppable. That when your God is behind you and it, it is, He is in your choice in a godly way, together you can do it. The other revelation I had is that every day we really are staring God in the face and saying, I have the power to free you or kill you. Because you know what? We do. You have the power to free Him to work in your life and the power to free him to work in your relationships or you have the power to kill him in you. And it makes all the difference in the world. See, Pilate had so many chances. The crowd had so many chances. The Jewish leaders had so many chances. But they all missed them. How many chances will you get? And how many more will you miss? I pray today that God's word was a lamp unto your feet and that it will be a light unto your path every day this week. Amen. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Amen.